platter. And the king was sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he commanded it to be given. He sent and had John beheaded in the prison, and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took the body and buried it, and they went and told Jesus. Okay, a lot going on here, and I'm going to do my best to try to explain the history behind this so that we can gain some understanding as to why John the Baptist just got his head cut off, literally cut off. So the first thing we can write down is this. John the Baptist is killed by Herod. So you'll notice at verse one that it says, at that time, Herod the Tetrarch. So the Herod to whom we're referring is Herod the Tetrarch. He heard about the fame of Jesus. He gets nervous. He says to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He's come back from the dead. Now at verse three in your Bible, we have a flashback, okay? Just like when you're watching a movie and there's a scene happening in real time and then there's a cutaway to something that occurred at a time prior to the time of the first scene. That's what Matthew does in chapter 14. Beginning at verse three, there is a flashback, there is a cutaway to events that preceded verses one and two. And those events are the killing of John the Baptist and the reasons why Johnny B was killed. So here it is, Herod the Tetrarch, different Herod from the Herod that we were introduced to at the beginning of the book. Herod the Tetrarch had John killed because John challenged his wrongful marriage to his sister-in-law. So verse three, Herod seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias. So we have Herod the Tetrarch as one character. Now we have another character, Herodias. Who is Herodias? Herodias is Herod's brother's wife. He took his brother's wife as his wife. John the Baptist said, nah, man, you can't just take your brother's wife and make her your wife. That's not right. Now, at that time, when John the Baptist was challenging Herod the Tetrarch for marrying his brother's wife, his sister-in-law, okay, Herod wanted to have John killed then. But if you look in verse five, we find out why he didn't do it. He feared the people because the people considered John the Baptist to be a prophet. And so since he didn't want to stir up any mess with the people, he refrained from killing John the Baptist at that point. But the story goes on. This is why I had us talk about political scandals, because this is a political scandal. Now watch this. this. The story gets very weird here. Okay, verse six. Herod's birthday comes. He has a big party. You can imagine what this may have looked like. Herod is ruler, he has money, he is certainly popular, he has many friends. If you've ever read or are familiar at all with the book of Esther, there are many parallels here between the description of Herod and the description of the ruler at the beginning of, uh, of Esther, Ahasuerus, in the same way that he had that big gallivanting party, that's what Herod is having here. So it's Herod's birthday, okay? The daughter of Herodias. So this, uh, this might be a little hard for some of you, depending on how long of a day you've had, but think about the family tree, okay? Herod marries Herodias, okay? 
Herodias is Philip's wife. He marries her. At his birthday party, he has Herodias's daughter come and dance for him. Now that means that he had his stepdaughter, who is also his niece, dance for him at his birthday party. It, it, this, 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 is, this is the lot, okay, I know, but this is in the book, right? She literally is his niece biologically because it's Philip's daughter, okay? But because he married his sister-in-law, she is also his stepdaughter. So no matter how you slice it, this is a messed up situation and Herod has her dance for him. The story goes on. Okay, uh, verse six, Herod's birthday came the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Now her mother gets involved, Herodias, okay, and has her to say, give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. Because for whatever reason, Herodias had beef with John the Baptist for the way that John the Baptist was challenging her new husband, who is also her brother-in-law. Verse nine, the king was sorry, but because of his oaths and his guest, he commanded it to be given Conclusion of the story, John the Baptist gets his head cut off. Not metaphorically, but literally, John the Baptist gets beheaded. Ain't this an interesting story, sitting right here in your Bible? <laughs> a fascinating story. And also terribly wicked and filled with political corruption, as was common in the first century, and still today. So here's the uh cliff notes of it jtb jtb being john the baptist is a casualty of corrupt power jtb is a casualty of corrupt power specifically corrupt family power strangely Herod, the Tetrarch, believed that JTB came back from the dead and was reincarnated in the body of Jesus. And that's what we see in verses one and two. At that time, Herod, the Tetrarch, heard about the fame of Jesus, and he said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. You can imagine he may have been a little bit nervous as well. For he has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are working him. And then verse three, we have the flashback, right? So he believes that Jesus is John the Baptist, come back from the dead. Now, one of the reasons why this is strange is because Herod was not necessarily a religious man, but he seems to believe in some sort of reincarnation of his arch nemesis, John the Baptist. All right, here's the question that I want us to consider. Look with me at verse 13 of chapter 14. Verse 13 of chapter 14. Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. Someone can unmute themselves and answer this question. How does Jesus respond to the death of his cousin? Would you say that he um, was sad, so he withdrew? Yeah. Jesus is sad in verse 13. And think about it. He and John the Baptist have known each other all of their lives. You may remember from the beginning of Luke's gospel how he describes Mary visiting Elizabeth when they were both pregnant and John leaped in Elizabeth's womb. They've had this special connection from literally the time that they were in the womb. And here we see the remarkable humanity of Jesus. Imagine 
Jesus receiving the news. Yeah, sure. John is dead. I mean, and, and his heart sinking, so on and so forth. I don't want to elongate that, but again, this is another case where we can see Jesus experience the real human emotions that we do, including feeling sorrow, not only over a family member or someone who's, you know, kinfolk dying, but this is his cousin with whom he has been tight. And uh, this is his cousin with whom he has been bonded in ministry as well. And even though they had their issues a couple chapters back, you remember when John was questioning whether or not he is the Messiah and Jesus kind of had to sharply respond to him. Okay, they've had their ups and downs, but what cousins don't have <laughs> their ups and downs together? Jesus is sad. Now, here's what's fascinating. Even more fascinating. It's already been fascinating. Here's what's even more fascinating. What happens to Jesus as he is trying to grieve and process? Someone can unmute themselves and respond. What happens to Jesus as he is trying to grieve and process? The people followed him. The people followed him. They wouldn't leave him alone. <laughs> and, you know, I don't want to speculate too much here, but uh, I can imagine that there was a little bit of a <sighs> on Jesus's part when he saw the people <laughs> pressing in on him as he's trying to deal with himself. He still is Jesus, and people still want him. They're still calling him. They're still sending him text messages. His inbox is still full in the morning, right? Hey, Jesus, just can I get a real quick second dot? Hey, would you mind? You know, if you have a minute, my daughter, if you know, if you have some time, you know, some of you know, okay, what it is like, especially if you've been in any kind of ministry position or if you're a parent. If you've been in any kind of leadership position at a job, you know what it is like for people to need you. And even when you're trying to deal with your own humanity, your own self, things going on that they don't know about, the crowd likely does not know that John the Baptist is dead. They may or may not even know that he and Jesus uh, are cousins and that Jesus is grieving. But nevertheless, they're pressing in on him, right? Because they have a sick kid and they need a word from God, literally. You know what I'm saying? They, they, they need something from Jesus. And so here's another question for you. How does Jesus respond to this interruption? I'll actually read. Look with me at verse 14. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. You know, I've read that verse so many times, but until you realize the context, it doesn't hit like it's meant to hit. You know what I mean? You think, oh, okay, yeah, Jesus had compassion on them. Of course he had compassion on them, he's Jesus. But when you understand that he was in the midst of grieving, he was dealing with his own personal issues here, right? And nevertheless, can imagine him breathing in and breathing out and saying, all right, Jesus, wiping his own tears, standing up and ministering to the people. Text goes on, verse 15. Now, when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, we have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up the twelve baskets full of broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about five thousand men besides women and children. Pop quiz, where are these from? You can unmute yourself and shout it out or you can type it into the chat. Where are these from?
Oh, y'all don't be shy. I know you be eating now. Where are these from? Buffalo Wild Wings. Ooh, not quite. They would be nice if they had these. Where are these from? Texas Roadhouse. Texas Roadhouse. Thank you, wife. Texas Roadhouse. In the background, you can maybe see the uh, the uh, the maple butter. What about these? <laughs> Where are these from? Uh, Red Lobster. Red Lobster. Red Lobster. Red Lobster. Six years I worked for Red Lobster. Great years. This one's kind of obvious. Um, name is Olive Garden. In the image. Oh yes. Who likes some uh -huh. Olive Garden bread? Yeah. If you dip it in the Alfredo sauce, it's worth the three something dollars extra because, <laughs> especially when they're soft. But then if they're not soft and you dip them in the Alfredo, it can make them still all right. Mm. What about this one? Who has this bread? Papa Joe's. It actually does look like Papa Joe's bread. This isn't oh. Papa Joe's, but they do pretty much have the same kind of bread. This one is uh, a little bit more of a fast, casual place. Mm. Oh, oh, that boy? Panera? Panera, yeah, this is Panera's bread. This is Panera's is bread. Okay? All right, well, why am I showing pictures of bread? It's not just to make you hungry. It is because <laughs> in this narrative, we have Jesus feeding a crowd of 5,000 people. Now, this is a story with which we uh, are very familiar. Uh, I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on it. And it's also recorded in each of the other gospels. And John does an extended treatment of this narrative. And uh, I've preached on that in the past. It's my favorite text in the whole Bible, John chapter six, after Jesus feeds these crowds and the events that take place. Nevertheless, we'll just spend a little bit of time looking at how Matthew treats this. So the first thing to write down is that there is a total number of over 10,000 humans. It was 5,000 men. That number does not include women and children. And so it was 10,000 plus folk that pressed in on Jesus in the midst of his grief, needing him. He ministered to them. And then he says, as we're familiar with, these people need to eat. Here's the point of the story, okay? This miracle story pictures Jesus as the new Moses. He is feeding God's hungry people physically and spiritually. So like I said, each of the gospel writers includes this story in their gospel account and they have some slightly different objectives within their telling of the story. But as we know by now, Matthew cares a lot about presenting Jesus as a new Moses, especially because his original audience was a Jewish audience. And so they really would appreciate those Old Testament parallels and particularly those strong connections from the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. And you all recall the Israelites being in the wilderness and needing food and bread literally raining down from heaven. Manna, they were fed. And Moses also gives them the law and he fed them spiritually. Well, this story right here, of course it happened, but the reason why Matthew chooses to place it not only in his gospel, but where he does is because he's trying to communicate that this Jesus is like the other significant leader in Israel's past, but he is greater than that leader. He is the new Moses. You don't have to write this down. I just put this in here so we can see it. The Gospel of John gives us more details on this story. And in the Gospel of John, we have a claim from Jesus. It is one of the seven I am statements that John records in his Gospel. It is after this event that Jesus says, I am the bread of life. So in this day, bread was 
the main fixture of most meals. This was not a meat eating culture in the way that we are a meat eating culture. Right now in my house, right behind this door, there is a whole chicken cooking in our oven that I can't wait to eat when class is finished. That was not common in the ancient world. What would have been common was for bread to be in the oven. You would eat bread, maybe with some herbs and vegetables on the side, so on and so forth. So uh, when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, he's not saying I am the side dish of life or I am the starter before the meal of life. He is saying, I am the essential of life. I am the main course of life. You need me in order to survive. That's why I showed you these pictures. All right, moving on. Um, in verse 22, you can look with me real quick. We have another story with which we are quite familiar. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten between the waves for the wind, excuse me, was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. Beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. And when they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent around to all that region and brought to him all who were sick and implored him that they might only touch the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. Then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? Now, if you just felt a real sharp interruption, maybe even just a little bit of irritability, like, oh, we were jiving. He was feeding crowds and walking on the water and healing, and here they come again. You should feel that way, right? The arrival of the Pharisees here in the text is annoying, right? It's getting to the point by this point where it's like, come on, guys, can you leave this man alone? He's doing good. The text goes on. For they do not wash their hands when they eat. Now, time out. You might agree with the Pharisees if the type of hand washing you're thinking of is purely for hygienic purposes, especially in the COVID world. I hope you wash your hands before you eat, and even pre-COVID and post-COVID. <laughs> Nevertheless, that's not what they have in mind. They have ceremonial hand washing rituals that weren't for the purpose of hygiene, but were for the purpose of appearing pure and holy before God. And so uh, the, the Pharisees come up, you know, they always have an agenda, okay? They always have something that they're gonna pin Jesus with. So why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands when they eat. And imagine Jesus taking a deep breath. He's kind of had a hard week, right? His cousin died. He's had a whole lot of mystery going on. He just had to walk on water. He says back to them, verse three, and why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, honor your father and your mother. And whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if anyone tells his father or mother, what would you have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites. Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And he called the people to him and said to them, hear and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a person. Then the disciples came and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? He said, every plant 
that my heavenly father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. <laughs> uh, three funny words of Jesus. I, I promise I'm reading this straight out of your Bible. Jesus says, let them alone. <laughs> they are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, explain this parable to us. And he said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. Okay, much going on here. Let's raise this question. What is Jesus's big problem with the Pharisees? Can I mute yourself and share? Based on what we just read, what's his big issue with them? I would say tradition. Mm-hmm. And someone add to that. What specifically about tradition is Jesus's issue with the Pharisees? If they were so concerned about washing their hands and being holy instead of what they were um, doing internally. Mm -hmm. I heard uh, Minister Ed. Go ahead, Minister Ed. I think I heard him. Oh, I was just saying that it's all for show, all for outward appearance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all for show, all for outward appearance. Anyone else want to answer this? What is Jesus's big problem with them? Besides the fact that they're just annoying. Um, they were hypocrites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he says it in verse seven. You hypocrites. You say one thing and you're doing another. And, and the reason why he cites the example about honoring father and mother, we don't need to get into the, into the weeds of that, but his, his rhetorical point there is you yourself have certain traditions that break the commands of God. You are contradicting your own selves with some of the traditions that you keep and yet you keep heaping these heavy burdens upon other people and so when he calls the people to himself what he's communicating with the extended metaphor about what defiles a person and yes he is you know talking about going to the bathroom and what you expel and so forth that is what he is intending for you to be thinking of his point is that what you take in is not what defiles you. It is what comes out, okay? And so in verse 17, he says, do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? What comes in, it goes back out, okay? The other end. But what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart. His point here is that it is not those external things according to certain traditions that you do, which make you pure. He's not saying that external things don't matter. He's saying those are not the things that make you pure. It is what comes out of the heart that is indicative of who you are and where you stand in relation to God. And so this little teaching right here is not the beginning, but it is a part of the beginning, or not the first mention, but it's part of the beginning of this theme that is going to continue to unfold for the rest of the New Testament, that God is interested in the transformation of women and men on the inside. And then what happens is, if he can get the heart the external behavior will change because what is in you will come out of you. And I just love the fact that in verse 14, Jesus says, let them alone. Maybe one day 
I'll preach that. That just sounds like a perfect sermon title, doesn't it? Let them alone. Okay, moving on. We have another story that we are very familiar with. This is somewhat of a controversial story. And so I want to read it. It's short. And then I have a question for us to discuss related to it. And Jesus went away, I'm in verse 21, and Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answered, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. That also will preach. And he answered, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. Here's a question for discussion. Was Jesus rude to the Canaanite woman? I don't think so. And why is that, Minister Causey? Because he was still, that love that he had in his heart, he was just saying, it's not your turn yet, that's all. I just don't believe in that rude. Yes. Good to see you, by the way, also. Someone else want to contribute. Was Jesus rude to the Canaanite woman? What do you think? Um, I would say by today's standard, a little bit. You know, there's a touch of, touch of, touch of attitude there. Like you are, you know, beneath the children of Israel. It's not, it's not your time yet. But he's also Jesus. So then he, you know, knew what he was doing sort of a test of faith sure. or persistence of, of that woman. Yeah, good thoughts, good thoughts. Anyone else want to contribute an answer? Was Jesus rude to the Canaanite woman? Certainly you've probably heard this preached before. It's actually a difficult passage. There's a lot to it. We're not going to get into all the nuances. I'll say that it's very fascinating to, oh, we have some action in the chat. Hold on. I'm going to read this. Uh, Victory 1021 says, yes, he was, but rude with a purpose. <laughs> rude with a purpose. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's definitely some cultural dynamics going on here, and um, I'm curious to know uh, how this was perceived when it happened in real time. Evidently, he, not evidently, obviously, he has care for the woman, and there is somewhat of a test dynamic going on, because after she persists in her requests, very similarly to the persistent widow, very similarly to the woman with the issue of blood, he eventually praises her greatly and says, O oh woman, great is your faith, be it done to you as you desire, so on and so forth. And so there's some, something to do with a test of faith here. And there's also this reality that at this point in Jesus's ministry, he was not yet ministering to the Gentiles. As a matter of fact, if we're just talking about Jesus's three years of ministry, he rarely ever focused on Gentiles. He focused the majority of his three years on Israel. And then it's not until the book of Acts, after he is raised from the dead and gives the Great Commission, as the video talked about, that he then can ministers to the Gentiles in and through the apostles of the early church. So what he says is true, right? 
at this time, I'm only being sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but he has enough room and flexibility, even though that's his focus, to look at this woman and say, ah, there's something different about you. I'm going to push pause for a moment on my regularly scheduled agenda and do something for a Gentile. Very fascinating. I'll let you continue to kind of think about that and maybe read or reread this text. Um, certainly, I, I like what, what Ed said. By today's standards, yeah, some might see it as rude, but you also have to remember the context in which Jesus was, a very patriarchal society. So maybe he was rude, but he also um, broke some rules in the way that he praised the woman at the end. So it's very hard to put Jesus in a box. That's one of the conclusions we can draw from this narrative. It's very hard to put Jesus in a box. Okay, verse 29 says, Jesus went on from there and walked beside the Sea of Galilee. And he went up on the mountain and sat down there and great crowds came to him, bringing with them the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. And they put them at his feet and he healed them so that the crowds wondered. When they saw the mute speaking, the crippled healthy, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. Here's a question for you that I'll answer for the sake of time. Where have we seen this before? Earlier in the Gospel of Matthew. All throughout the Gospel of Matthew, we have seen this exact same scenario. Jesus is minding his own business, crowds to him, lame people, blind people, crippled people, mute people, many others. And what does he do? He heals them. Again, we see that Jesus is not just proclaiming in word the kingdom, but he is demonstrating in deed and in power the kingdom. So the mute speak, the crippled are healthy, the lame walk, the blind see, and people glorify the God of Israel. This is how chapter 15 concludes, and this is how we'll conclude tonight. Verse 32, then Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat, and I am unwilling to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. And the disciples said to him, where are we to get enough bread in such a desolate place to feed so great a crowd? And Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? They said, seven and a few small fish. And directing the crowd to sit down on the ground, he took the seven loaves and the fish. And having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up seven baskets full of the broken pieces left over. Those who ate were 4,000 men besides women and children. And after sending away the crowds, he got into the boat and went to the region of Magadan. Here's the final discussion question for the night. Is this the same story as earlier or a different one? Is this the same story as earlier or a different one? Got some action in the chat. Victory 1021 says no different crowd. Anyone else wanna offer their thoughts? Is this the same story as earlier or a different one? I would go with a different story. And um, just a little cheat sheet note from my study bible it says that the feeding of the 5,000 is recorded in all four gospels but the feeding of the 4,000 is only recorded in Matthew and Mark um, and then the 12 baskets are mentioned in the 5,000 um, oh that's a separate note but yeah um, I would vote for different different yeah. crowds yeah so this is, I would oh, go ahead. And I was just gonna say I would too I'll vote for a different crowd mm-hmm yeah, so this is a, a different story, strikingly similar to the other story that we're most familiar with. The main difference 
between these two stories is the audience. You may have or may not have caught this in the video earlier. In The Feeding of the 5,000, the audience is primarily Jewish. In The Feeding of the 4,000, the audience is primarily Gentiles, non-Jewish people. Jesus performs essentially the same sign for two separate audiences, one primarily Jewish, one primarily Gentile. Now, that could just be a cool little fact of history, but there's also something theological happening here. Think about the narrative we just read a little bit about the Canaanite woman. The Canaanite is Gentile. This crowd are Gentiles. It seems that right around this halfway point of Matthew's gospel, something interesting is stirring up as it relates to the kingdom of God's expansion beyond just the house of Israel, but also including non-Israelites, non-Jews, Gentile people. This is a small thing, but considering the fact that I'm speaking to a class of all non-Jewish people who claim the name of Jesus Christ, this is also really significant. And when we get to a book like Acts, we see this developing more and more and more. Though Jesus is not there in flesh, he's setting some things in motion as early here as Matthew chapter 15, 14 and 15 that uh, eventually work its way all the way to the south suburbs of Chicago. And there are men and women who look absolutely nothing like a Middle Eastern Jew. But yet, we call on this same Jesus. Why is that? That's a rhetorical question. We can continue talking about that as time goes on. I do see there's one question in the chat here as we close. It says, when he healed the woman's daughter, did that attract the crowds to him? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Um, every single time he did anything, miraculous, it always resulted in more people being drawn to him, his popularity increased. Yeah, that's a good question. Any other questions or comments that anyone would like to make as we conclude our hour of power tonight? In your spare time, <laughs> If you're so interested in it, you can um, do your own research on John the Baptist situation with Herod the Tetrarch and Herodias. There's a lot of fascinating stuff to it. Um, or you can just go eat some bread or, or something else. <laughs> okay, well, the Lord bless you. I'll see you not next week, but the week after next. We'll continue on in Matthew's Gospel. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.